my name is Bobby Hinty. I came straight to Duke to do a PhD in biochemistry. Uh, and I graduated with my PhD in November 2015. Now I'm a postdoc in the same lab that I did my PhD in. I'm Savannah. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, now I go to Duke and I'm studying neuroscience and I have a minor in linguistics and global health. My name is Kathy Rudy and I work at Duke University. My name is Nina Miller. I grew up in Mount Clinton, uh, which is a small rural area just outside of Harrisonburg. I'm working on my Masters of Divinity uh, here at Duke. I'm Jay Pandy. I'm a freshman at Duke University and I'm from uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I'm a computer, prospective computer science major, so comp sci is something that's really uh, <laughs> near to my heart. Hi, I'm Kupi Sobleto. I am a senior at Duke University. I am a psychology major from Houston, Texas. Um, officially, I have cerebral poly, and then during puberty, I developed dystonia, and that's why my speech is a little impaired and my neck's a little does a little bit wrong, which it wants to go left. My disability is a receptive language disorder. It's an audio processing problem, so it, it's categorized as a learning disability, but it, it's pretty much a hearing loss. Um, and basically, I've heard it described like, um, like dyslexia for hearing. It just, sometimes my brain doesn't quite process sound as language, it just, just kind of comes in as sound. I was diagnosed with osteoporosis and advanced osteoporosis. And so the disabilities are mostly in bone and leg problems. My disability is ADHD and I also have a learning disability in reading comprehension. I have cerebral palsy. Um, I was born prematurely at 28 weeks. And um, so that's obviously had a quite a significant impact on my life. I have um, some motor processing delays. Also, I have cortical visual impairment. It causes me to miss, miss words and, and that sort of thing. My disability is I'm actually a little person. I have spondyloepimetaphyseal dysplasia, also known as SEMD for short. That just basically means that I am a lot shorter than most. And, um, but even though I'm short, I'm proud of it. There was this one time in elementary school where like, I was walking with my mom and there was a class that was walking outside and all of them were like pointing, staring and poking and the teacher didn't say anything. She just let them, you know, let them do that. My mom did teach me, she taught me how to advocate for myself and how to stand up to these type of people. It was Worse as a kid, it was one of those things, my family just thought that I had hearing loss. Um, I would, I had a lot of trouble hearing like cars and stuff, so I would almost get run over a lot or like, you know, end up with uh, just, just things, random things that I just really wouldn't hear coming. And so then <laughs> everyone would just be like, whoa, did you not hear that? <laughs> you know, no, I didn't. I think if I had been in big classes, it would have been harder because you know, you're farther away from the teacher, it's harder to lip read, it's harder to you know, um, understand, there's more background noise, more people, there's less individual attention. You know, so I think smaller classes are definitely easier. I was diagnosed between the first and second semesters of my first year of undergrad. Um, I had had a really hard time, I had a really hard time uh, focusing in class. Uh, focusing on doing my homework, um, being able to do my homework well. I came really close to failing out of my first semester of undergrad because um, of my disability. I would study for three or four hours, you know, for a really short exam in the middle of the semester and would get a D or an F. Um, so I would get frustrated and not study and get a C. I um, was in academic coaching for three semesters and uh, took my GPA from a 2.1 my first semester to a 3.2 by the time I graduated. Wow. How are you? Oh, yeah. How are you? Good, yeah. <laughs> Coming into Duke, it was really nice being with everyone who was very mature and open-minded about people with differences. 
the only negative thing I've encountered at Duke and that this has been actually a recent was I was walking back from my dorm and there was just one person who didn't know this person but he essentially proceeded to ask hey can I ask you uh, a question I hope it's not insensitive but how does it feel to be a dwarf hearing it out loud it actually sounds very you know objectified and it's it's like but like why would you even think that's an appropriate answer question to ask someone who you, you know you just met Hello. I've had this opportunity to express what disability is here at Duke because it's not talked about a lot. Like the first time I asked if anyone has documented disability here at Duke, they said no. Being my disability, like I said, I have a fine motor disability. Being a scientist in biochemistry with a fine motor disability what you can do is limited, I should say, because most most research in this field takes place at the bench. So think of pipettes and test tubes and all that. Um, for all practical purposes, I cannot do that. It's really a shame that I have the job that I do because um, I like it. I like what I do. I don't like the physical aspect of what I do. Um, just sitting here is is uh, not that fun for me. I really like to travel with my life. Um, and when we travel, we usually go hiking or kayaking. Most professors are really helpful and um, really willing to, you know, do what needs to be done to work things out. Um, I did have one professor in um, Biology 202 um, who the assistive technology uh, director, uh, Rebecca, she emailed him to tell him that he needed to close caption the videos um, that he was going to show in class. Um, or I think also he could send them to her and she would caption them. Yeah. And he emailed her back with this kind of rude or, or dismissive email back, just kind of saying basically no. And, and I think another reason he gave was, was just kind of along the lines of like, I don't see why this is necessary. Um, and it was, a little, it was a little disheartening because, you know, it was a little dismissive. I think at first, for the first year, they were wonderful. Since then, I think, you know, there's quite a bit of expectation that, okay, now you should be better. And, you know, now you should be fitting in and doing more. And the reality is that's just not the way the body works. These front two rows okay. is where we'll have you sit, okay. either to the right to or the right. to the left. Okay. My name is Lee Fickling and I am the director of the Disability Management System at Duke and we are the office that oversees the um, accommodations for students, faculty, staff, and visitors to campus for people that have disabilities. So I think that, you know, what we're seeing nationwide is that there's a trend that more and more students with disabilities are coming to colleges and universities. And I think part of that has to do with the lowering of the threshold from the ADA Amendments Act of 2008. Um, and so you. when Congress passed the ADA Amendments Act, I think really what happened is that there are many more health conditions now that qualify as a disability. And so many more people are qualified, you know, to be able to seek accommodations while they're in college um, and I think that colleges and universities are doing a better job about being able to accommodate students whether those are classroom accommodations housing accommodations student activity accommodations um, same thing for you know employees as well Thank you, baby. I love you. And DDA sat in with the architects kind of as they were envisioning West Union. They actually sat down with them and said you know these are some things as a student with a disability that we would like to see you know, don't put the elevator in the back part of the building when the accessible door is at the front, you know, and they really kind of talked through with that. I am the current president of Duke Disability Alliance, and first, I just kind of want to talk about what um, 
DDA is. So we're a student organization on campus and we essentially advocate for the rights of people with disabilities, whether it be getting physical accommodations, um, making sure that the paths on campus are accessible to more educating purposes, like letting people know on campus about different disability issues that are going on around the world. And so one of the people with disabilities on campus, I think, need to come together and actually talk about these issues rather than hiding from it. Because the more in numbers we have, and the more we talk about it, the more action that can be take, taking place. And I think it's important for people with disabilities to realize that, you know, we, we have a voice. And we can't just sit around and do nothing and expect that someday someone's going to change the world. We all have to act together. There can't be just one singular person to make that change. As far as my work with DDA, I joined uh, last semester uh, as a freshman and um, because I really wanted to be able to connect with other people with disabilities at Duke and, uh, and um, be able to, to make a difference at Duke to make, uh, to make life easier for um, me and people like me. So we are here uh, tabling with Pi Kappa Phi um, to get people to sign the pledge for Accessibility Matters Day to take only accessible routes on Thursday, uh, March 30th. Um, yeah, so uh, I've helped with planning certain events and, and um, to help Duke and the uh, Triangle community become a more inclusive place for people with disabilities. You know, at Duke, when I think about what is our society, you know, you look outside and, you know, it's springtime now and we see a whole bunch of able-bodied individuals, you know, on quads and they're throwing footballs and frisbees and they're laying out in the sun. You know, how are we able to get our students with disabilities and make them part of that? Really allow the students to be able to make the decision, who do you want to be? You know, when you come to Duke, what do you want to do? Well, you know, you want to be a salsa dancer while you're here. So we want to make sure that you have every single opportunity that there is for you to be able to salsa dance. We want you to have your own Duke experience, you know, and again, if that means that you want to, you know, be in your arts theme house or, you know, you want to salsa dance or you want to, you know, have a conference on campus, you know, or, or any, any other different type of activity that you can think of, you know, joining sorority rush or joining a selective living group, we want you to be able to have the Duke experience that you want to have and we want to be able to help you kind of along the way. I've gotten really involved in disc golfing down here. I love going hiking, playing sports. I officiate football and basketball, and then hopefully I'll start officiating soft, softball for uh, intramurals. I'll do anything outside. That was a satisfying chomp. <laughs> <laughs> well, first to make Duke more accessible is I think like we always talk about all the um, you know, different human rights group, groups on campus like the whole hashtag Black Lives Matter campaign and gender equality, LGBTQ equality, but disability equality and disability rights, that's nothing that's really, it's not really, no one has really thought about it. We talk about intersectionality a lot. like. People with disabilities, we make up um, the majority of the minority population sector. And I think it's really important for um, the history of the disability rights movement to be taught to a wider audience of people, like in schools, for example, like how we we make how we made an effort to teach the history of like minorities, like like Black History Month and that sort of thing. I think we also definitely need to make an effort to teach the. Um, teach about um, the history of people with disabilities and be open-minded and think about kind of be able to put yourself in other people's shoes and kind of try to empathize with what they go through. It's something that we need to be aware of, you know, that, that our actions do speak louder than our words. Um, and if we really care about the rights of folks with disabilities, if, if we really care about um, creating an environment where everybody has an equal opportunity at success, uh, then we need to be willing to act like it as well and not just do the word service. We need to keep in mind that we can't be so close-minded and think that our fighting for this specific thing is the only thing we should be fighting for. We should feel validated 
to how, you know, we feel about, you know, certain things in our life. Like, don't take that away from us, because that's a really big, you know, that's a really big thing, and it does sometimes hurt when people tell us that, oh, you shouldn't feel that way. I would say my closest friend before um, the illness, and during the first year of illness, she was wonderful, but now we almost never speak because I think, I know she thinks I should be just sort of sucking it up and doing it and that everybody gets tired and I should just, you know, do what I can and stop complaining and stop trying to get out of work. So we're kind of, that relationship is on hold and I don't know if it will be able to be picked back up or not. I hear it. You're not, you don't let your disability define you. Yeah. What does that even mean? I really don't know. I have no idea. Identifying myself as a disabled man is, makes as much sense as a disabled, identifying myself as having brown hair. It's nothing to be ashamed of, but not really anything to be proud of either. It's, it's not really who I am. We can't draw lines and say, these are things the disability count as a disability and these are not, you know? You need a walker, you're disabled, you need a cane, you're not. It's, it's very arbitrary. But I do think in general, the theme that I see is like people will put in like a wheelchair ramp and like be like, that's it, we're done. Disability rights should probably be like individualized and catered to each, you know, like the person who you're trying to, to help. What's important is to realize that like, you can't really just lump people together um, because, you know, peop different people have different needs and you have to be able to like change your system enough so that it can accommodate people in whatever way they need, not like in whatever idea you have of like what accommodating disabilities is. And people with disabilities can do things. It's very possible. Like there are ways for people with disabilities to do things everyone else can do. It may be different, it may be harder, and have the little bit of faith in us. At some point, at some point in my life, I would love to start a farm for foster kids. I think I, I definitely see myself doing um, working um, in some capacity. I'm a servant of God. I did a lot of online dating, and then I finally paid money, and I did the harmony. Um, and I the first girl I met and went on a date with on the harmony uh, of my life. I love to do art. I've recently become really into acting. My, my dream, my dream would be to dance on Dancing with the Stars, but ideally I think I want to um, pursue more of a career in, um, in video making or digital media. I do a lot of things, but I had to work very hard to get there. Like I didn't just wake up and suddenly it was all given to me. I had to work really hard. But I know that I can do this and everyone else can too. You have a voice, and speak up. It's important that we all speak up because otherwise no change is gonna come about it.